This is an exclusive excerpt from the Stuff File program with Peter Anthony Holder. Now, the Stuff File presents Andrew Fazekas, the Night Sky Guy. It's radio that's out of this world. Andrew Vazakis, the night sky guy, is a member of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada and the author of National Geographic's Backyard Guide to the Night Sky and also National Geographic's Stargazer's Atlas, the ultimate guide to the night sky. And Andrew, America has landed on the moon for the first time in half a century. Yeah, isn't this amazing? It's just incredible uh, to to see this feat happen. It's been I don't know. I've been following these stories of uh, the commercial landers, these private attempts to to land on the moon, and it's just you know hasn't been successful. And finally, it looks like we've got a soft landing. I don't think we're still out of the woods yet on in terms of how successful the mission will be in terms of carrying out all the mandated experiments that are on board. Uh, We've got a weak signal on the main high-gain antenna uh, upon landing. That was a nail-biter because we didn't hear anything back from the spacecraft for the first few minutes after its supposed landing. So we were just like, it's just total silence. Uh, But then they did get this faint signal, and now they're starting to work on, you know, just boosting that up and seeing what they can get. Hopefully, we'll be getting pictures very soon, and some of the payloads that NASA has to examine the the lunar surface is going to happen. But, you know, Peter, this is a big step because NASA is, you know, gave out billions of dollars of contracts to commercial companies in the hopes of really having them be the shuttle service or the taxi service to uh, shuttling uh, uh, equipment to the surface of the moon. This is going to be big business. And they're trying to um, stimulate the private industry in terms of space exploration, giving out these big contracts to have them do literally the heavy lifting of getting their equipment to the moon for NASA. These private missions, they haven't been successful so far. So Intuitive Machines, based out of Houston, seems to be the first one out of the gate on the surface of the moon successfully having landed and hopefully it sets the scene for many future robotic missions in the coming years it's going to be really important because it lays the foundation for the artemis program that nasa has this is the the program that will see humans returning to the surface of the moon the first time in 50 in over a half a half a century 50 years so there's a lot of work to be done to make sure that the moon is a safe environment for those future astronauts, and this is the first mission to help do that. Well, this mission, which is called Ode- o- o- Odysseus, or Odie for short, uh, you mentioned that there's still some questions as to whether it can complete its actual mission. What exactly is this first mission onto the moon? The big thing, first off, is the ability to land, to stick the landing successfully, and it seems like it pretty much did that because it's sending back signals. Now, maybe off kilter, we don't know. We'll see if it can, you know, really conduct all the the instruments, making sure that they work, all the scientific uh, projects that they have on board. And really what they all encompass is being able to characterize the lunar environment. So it's looking at things like radiation levels that future astronauts would potentially be exposed to on the fut- on the surface of the moon. Also characterizing the local environment, which is really interesting, Peter, because this particular lander was pegged to go to the south pole of the moon. And if you remember, we've talked many times about the Artemis mission and where they're going to be setting up future human settlements on the moon. And it's really focused on the south pole of the moon because we think there's large reservoirs of water ice that is readily available for us to mine, use it as a resource to create not just drinking water, but also creating fuel, rocket fuel, by separating the hydrogen and the oxygen from the water molecules and uh, having that hydrogen as fuel, oxygen also to for, for a breathable environment. It's 
really the most valuable resource that we could have on another world is access to unlimited amounts of water. And so that's why Intuitive Machines mission was pegged to go to the South Pole and to characterize that very specific environment that future human astronauts will be exposed to. And also, wasn't a bonus point the fact that because it's on the South Pole, it is the best place uh, for communication back to Earth? Yeah, I mean, there's also these, these sweet spots on the moon that allows you to have kind of permanent 24-hour-a-day abilities to communicate without having to rely on relay satellites. Many of these other locations on the moon um, will, you know, they basically, uh, there are times where it's not in the straight line of sight with the Earth. And so from this vantage point, we get this really great direct line of communication. And that's why when the signal didn't come up here, you know, right, they were expecting 15 seconds after landing to hear from the spacecraft. And that didn't happen. They actually had to wait over five minutes. They had to employ really large radio telescopes here on Earth and point it directly at the landing site specifically to listen for those faint signals being sent back. As a matter of fact, didn't they have to use uh, the satellite in Australia? Yeah, the radio telescope, and uh, one of these were the radio telescopes in Australia, a 64-meter wide dish, and that was very critical for them to be able to listen, to pick up that faint signal. They were worried that, you know, maybe the, the spacecraft might have tumbled over on its side or something. So they really needed to employ some of the largest telescopes to, to listen to that very faint signal. Wasn't another country, didn't they recently literally land on their head? On the moon? Was... <laughs> yeah, I think you're thinking about Japan. Japan, yeah. yeah th there was that j attempt just a few weeks ago, basically in, in January, where they attempted to land, but again, they feel that they they toppled over uh, their space. They, uh, you know, the surface of the moon is very rocky, and, and it's an unforgiving environment. There's no atmosphere uh, to cushion your landing. You really have to use these retro rockets to to actively land, propel yourself down to the surface. And it's a it's a very tricky maneuver, especially when you have a, a very uh, rough terrain, a rocky environment. And, you know, just one little miscalculation of where the landing should be, and you can easily topple over. And you have to remember, Peter, that these usually in these landing scenarios, we're talking about about a, a, an hour out from landing it all goes uh, autonomously. So it's on autopilot. And the onboard computers have to make all the decisions of where it is safe underneath the spacecraft to actually make the landing attempt. The other thing I found fascinating, because you say everything is autonomous in this situation, and I, and I was also watching the, uh, the live uh, feed when it did land on Thursday. And the thing that I found fascinating in the preamble leading up to that was that there were so many sensors and so many cameras on this particular uh, lander that it was going to uh, take pictures and, and let us know just how much dust was coming up because of the landing. And that is part of the information that they want in order to decide when there are moon bases on the moon, how close a, a rocket ship can land to a, a base or other people or other structures that are up there. So it's it really is a fact-finding mission right from the, the, the touchdown. Absolutely. I mean, you're touching on a really interesting point, Peter, is the, the dust. I mean, I know that, you know, that is something of a huge concern in for mission planners, not just for, you know, uh, land the landers themselves, but if you have rovers scouting about on the surface of the moon, and of course, astronauts, the lunar dust is notorious for getting into everything and uh, into places that you would never expect the dust to, to reach. And I think, you, I mean, you, you've had the good fortune of interviewing uh, Apollo astronauts. Um, one of them I know was uh, Alan Bean, who was a painter. Right. And it was really interesting. You know, he actually got uh, a hold of one of his old astronaut suits and it was filled with dust 
lunar dust all over it. And when they entered into the the capsule, the lunar lander, and during the Apollo 12 mission, yeah, you know, they were like filled with dust on the outside of of them doing their excursions, their moonwalks. It was a problem that they had to deal with. And even today, this is something that's really important indeed for when designing habitat areas. How close can you get in terms of the landing pads for like resupply missions? How close would you want that to your habitats? These are unknowns. These are things that we still have to figure out before we we live and work on the moon permanently. Again, watching the uh, the live feed and and getting information like this, it really shows how uh, not only how well thought out this whole mission is, but how they are forward thinking in finding out the minute details of everything they need to know to populate the moon at some point. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, this is a fact-finding mission. There's no doubt about it. And I think it's going to actually guide future robotic missions that are coming in the pipeline over the next couple of years. This is coming at a very critical time for NASA because they just a few uh, just a, f- a month or so ago, they announced this delay in the first missions, the human missions and the Artemis program. So the Artemis II, where we had uh, a crew of four, including a a Canadian, Jeremy Hansen, that will be the first humans to go out to the distance of the moon since the Apollo times. They're not going to land on on Artemis II. They'll just circle the moon and come back. Uh, That mission has been delayed by just over a year into into the late part of 2026. And then, of course, the, the Artemis 3 after that is delayed by a year as well. And those are because of techni- technological delays in, in the development of the Orion capsule that where the astronauts will be living and working in. So the safety aspects have to be met. But this delay... I think it's going to be a boon for the robotic missions because it's going to allow development of more of these commercial low budget missions to really characterize, flesh out exactly the safety concerns on the surface of the moon before we send those astronauts there. So I expect to have more missions, uh, robotic missions, and um, they'll be fleshed out thanks to what Intuitive Machine uh, Mission is doing currently. Well, speaking of delays, we had a lot of things we wanted to talk about, but because of Odie, we have to delay all that. But we can go to Patreon and talk about the other issues that we didn't get a chance to talk about, and there are several. So are you willing to do that, sir? Yeah, let's do it. Let's hop on over. Hop on over we shall. That's Andrew Vizekas, the night sky guy. You can go to my website at thestuffile.com to the page for this show, which is show number 0758, and you'll find links to Andrew's site to get your own personal autograph copy of his books. And you just heard, Patreon subscribers, you can hear more of Andrew as a Patreon reward extra where we'll discuss NASA's plan to have more astronauts spending more than a full year in space, the plight of Voyager 1, what's known as a misbehaving toddler star, and more. Just go to our Patreon page, and if you're not already a member, become one of the select patrons of the show. Visit patreon.com slash the Stuff File Program. You've just heard an exclusive excerpt from the Stuff File Program with Peter Anthony Holder. To hear any or all of the full hour-long shows, visit thestufffile.com. Stuff is spelled S-T-U-P-H. That's thestufffile.com. A presentation of Flying Fish Communications.